Welcome back to the Road Forward a podcast for trucking industry leaders brought to you by TruckSpy, the all-in-one fleet management platform built to empower your drivers to be compliant, productive, and safe. This is episode 41, and we got a good one. We're going to talk about some articles, and we have an interview with Cloud Trucks later on. But let me introduce the host. We got Flint. He is the CEO of TruckSpy. Flint, how are you, sir? Just great, Alex. Ready to dive in today. I, I thought I well, swear he was saying living, what living the dream. The dream. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had to break the trend. I brought. I oh man, fine. Okay, deal. And then we have our COO Matt. How are you, sir? Going on, Alex. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing all right too, man. Uh, so obviously, we start with a with some with some memes with some fun. Okay, now this one might not be un unre- this one might be unrelatable because uh, I don't know if you guys uh, Flint, you have a diesel truck, so you fill up deaf. Matt, you have a gasoline vehicle, so you don't. But I just saw this and I thought it was hilarious. Uh, so the meme is, no. it's like a, a tug of war. <laughs> and so then the, the line says how it feels when you're getting the death hose. No, that's, I mean, that's not even the worst part, right? The worst part is like trying to get the freaking transaction authorized and have it swipe your card 19 times. And no, I don't need reefer fuel, you know, all of this stuff. Right. I just, I laughed so hard because I was, I was, I remember I would literally look like that trying to pull the death hose. And I just, it was so, yeah. it was like nail on the head, man. It was hilarious. So um, now that, that was, uh, that was, I thought that was a good one, but obviously since neither of you laughed, probably not. Okay. Well, but, it's just, okay. it feels, I mean, I don't know what, I'll be honest in full disclosure. I don't know what the hell that means. It does okay. feels a little truck nerdy, nerdery, you know, it's like, Right. Def was introduced know. in 2012 and this is nerdy. Okay. That's fine. That's okay. We move on. Okay. So we got a Freightliner service van. It looks like, um, it looks like it's from, uh, Canada. Cause it says Ontario and look at what it says on the bottom of the, on the back of the van. If we can't fix your truck, we'll push it into the river and say, we never saw it. <laughs> that, Love it was once upon a time. That's awesome. There's once upon a time where I would have taken that anything to, uh, if I don't have to report it, <laughs> I mean, a friend, then, uh, you know, if we could just make it, the problem go away, I'd take that service. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I was just uh, uh, hilarious, man. I, I thought that was so, just so funny. And mechanics are getting expensive nowadays. So it's like, man, at least they're actually out there trying to solve problems. So I thought that was uh, really funny. Uh, yeah, Freightliner uh, service van. So, and the last one, of course, Matt, you can relate to this as our uh, uh, in-house safety person. Um, it's a, a picture of a, a four wheeler and a, it looks like a Euro spec flat nose truck. And it says, I finally passed him. I can slow down now. It's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I love it. I love it. I mean, it feels like I'm, I'm sure a lot of uh, our trucker friends would, would totally agree with this happening. Just in general. I mean, people just don't respect these, these poor guys out there. Just no yeah. respect for our truckers safe zone okay the um you know the, you need to have space between you and the vehicle behind you in front of you to left and right and so it's like this is certainly not how you do it so if you're gonna pass just keep passing create distance you see all the signs on the highways now like oh there's all those merge signs right it's like with the arrows like you leave space whatever um but the point remains the same i want to talk about because i talked about the kodiak robotics story um they they recently did or like at the end of last year they did a they started doing a somewhat autonomous route from Houston to Dallas area or just north of the Dallas area. And it looks like Kodiak Robotics is again, they're, um, they're, they're either they're expanding or they're, they're making moves, I guess. But um, Freight Waves has this article, Kodiak Robotics for and Forward Air begin a Dallas to Atlanta autonomous run. Now, the thing is this route, they have to do it three times a week. And they are putting right here, it says in the article, Kodiak uses four drivers rotating between local and long haul driving by the week. So they have to use four drivers to have one robotic truck drive. Uh, I just, I was like, man, uh, that, that is a lot of drivers to cover one lane. Now they, they did explain that this is a, an uncommon lane. Um, you know, a lot of drivers don't like driving this lane for some reason, but I just thought like, man, like I'm glad technology is making moves. But it's like, goodness gracious, if we have to put four drivers on one lane, do we have a long way to go? And I know, Flint, you talked about um, how some of these semi-autonomous or autonomous trucking companies, you mentioned, too, that some of their stock prices are way, way down. It's a it's a rough area to be in. What are your what are your thoughts on this article? I mean, I, I think, you know, I'll say the same thing I said the last time we talked about this. I mean, I think innovation is 
is great, right? I mean, this is how new stuff comes to market and how society moves forward. Um, and it, like, frankly, it takes a long time to get these things right, you know, and a lot of money. And uh, we've seen these companies come and go, you know, this one may come and go, like maybe in 50 years, we finally hit the nail on the head, right? Who, who knows? But uh, it's a, I mean, like, it's just not I, interesting technologically. I just don't think that the market has developed to accept this technology. Right. And to actually, uh, to add to that, right. The market not accepting is like, so that means Kodiak will generate revenue on a per mile basis, but it won't make money on the runs. Okay. So technically they're losing money every, every mile that they're driving on this run and their Houston to Dallas run. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting paying attention to how the industry does slowly adapt and change. Um, Matt, speaking of which, like you obviously have been in the industry a while and you've seen the rollout both in other safety technologies. Like, what's your opinion? Like, what are we looking at? Uh, how long do you think this is going to take for, um, for this I to become an it, actual legitimate thing? It's a really going to be a slow trickle, right? And then all of a sudden the dam will break at some point and it'll just happen quickly. I mean, I think we saw that with other types of technologies like tracking and cameras, even, um, dash cams, but. I thought this is kind of in line with how I expected this to go, uh, where the the, first, the immediate opportunity, once this, once we finally get comfortable with the fact that these trucks are driving themselves, it's going to be in that long haul, right? So you're still going to have local drivers, but you're not going to have to have people driving across the country, you know, nonstop, right? Where the intermediate stage in between point A and B um, can be handled autonomously, then you have your highly skilled human driver take care of that, those last few miles. So right. I think yeah. this is a, it's a great, it's a great step in the right direction. It's not going to be profitable anytime soon. It's not going to be, you know, fully autonomous anytime in the next couple of years, but it's going to be slow progress until all of a sudden we'll wake up one day and there's just, everything's yeah. going to be autonomous. Yeah, that's gonna. It's. I mean, it's gonna be cool. So that's why we're paying attention to it. Because obviously, if you're a driver, if you're an owner operator, if you're a fleet fleet owner or, or a fleet manager, like this is the type of stuff that you know starts right. affecting your business. Um, but yeah, uh, I, know I think it would Matt, be disingenuous of us if we're a tech company. We can't knock other tech companies for trying new things, right? That, 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 no, that's, that's what, what I said. I mean, I'm all about people jumping in and innovating, right? I mean, it's great. Right. Right. Let's just hope you have the money to burn if you're going to lose uh, <laughs> money on every mile you travel. That's all. <laughs> so, uh, but Flint, I know <laughs> right. we, we have some big news. Okay. Humongous news. And it looks like, um, I don't want to say they were acquired, but it looks like Night Swift is going to be acquiring, or there's some uh, a standing offer to acquire US Express. Talk to me. I know you, you saw this in, in Yahoo Finance. It's, uh, you know, been approved by the board of directors. So, not a done deal at this point, but 615 a share is like crazy. I don't know that they had to bid that high to buy this business. Um, and they're, you know, I don't know that there was really another logical buyer. The stock was at like, I don't know, a dollar or something. Um, so, or two dollars, whatever the number was. And then, you know, they bid 615 a share. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really interesting. Like, US Express has really struggled for a long time, right, to create margin. They've got a they've got a big fleet, generate a lot of revenue over the road, trucking primarily with some brokerage business. Let's see. Um, so they say 43% OTR, 32% dedicated contract, and 23% brokerage. But they've just really struggled to create margin. They're operating on these razor, razor thin margins. Um, they have huge CapEx expense. And I think that this is really a story around the competitive environment. Like it's, you know, it's really tough. Like there is advantage to scale, but it's really tough to compete with the uh, three truck operators in the over the road ball game, right? As a, as a big company. And that's the question, right? It's like, hold on. If Knight Swift, maybe they they have a little bit more operational experience. Maybe they have a little bit better scale and efficiency. Like, wouldn't it make sense for Knight Swift to acquire this next thing? Because you know, obviously, Knight Swift is, I believe, they're all over, but they're I think their home base is like Arizona. U.S. Express, to my understanding, is based somewhere on the East Coast. So it's like this it seems like a logical acquisition uh, or a potential acquisition to where um, you know they can actually take a business that has a lot of trucks. They can deploy a lot of units really quickly. They don't have to buy you know one or a hundred 
hundred at a time uh, to slowly roll them out. They could just buy, get a lot of units on the road really quickly and expand um, and cover more of the market. Um, doesn't this seem like a logical way uh, to, to really grow quickly? Matt? Yeah, I, I mean, it or definitely split, is. And I think it's, I think it's a creative for, for Knight Swift, especially if you can address the margin issue. You know, there's this whole idea of a BSB, which is a big shitty business. And uh, that's kind of where you don't want to be. Like, it's fun to be a big business, but you don't also want to be a shitty business. Like, you actually want to make money. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I think that the idea here, right, is that Knight Swift can pay the debt off, or at least a chunk of the debt. I think here in the paperwork, it says that they're going to keep the term debt. Um, so that'll clean up the balance sheet. I mean, USX had, right, a, a $153 million market cap. Like, it was trading below book value, you know, which obviously indicates, like, nobody has confidence that they can actually create earnings. So, I mean, it could be really good for, for Night Swift. I mean, it's probably a good way to grow your volume. You can get, you know, you can take these customers, you can run a bigger network, more, more robust network. I mean, I imagine Night Swift probably has some underutilization in different regions. And so, you know, you may actually be able to serve the same amount of business with slightly less trucks as on a combined basis. I, I, I mean, I think it's certainly accretive. For night for night swift right so okay. i'm just really surprised that they did 615 a share for this business right but, yeah. yeah it seems like they're overpaying that seems to be the trend okay just overpay if you want the deal to go through uh, matt what are your thoughts on mergers and acquisitions on on night swift getting oh. even bigger um what's what's your thoughts yeah i mean i i think the 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 big thing I, i'm hoping to see opportunities for smaller businesses get acquired if you know, that's a, a way for them to realize value and all the hard work. So to see two massive, uh, you know, operations merge, that's not as exciting to me. I'm hoping for these kind of opportunities for the smaller ones. Other than that, I mean, I don't know this. I don't know exactly what the uh, incentive would be to to make your operation that massive. Right. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm just maybe, thinking about the safety side don't. of things. Yeah, right. I'm sure they do. Oh, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Plenty that I don't. But from the safety side of things, I'm just thinking the poor safety managers and directors <laughs> trying to. They already have to deal with enough. If, so. Well, yeah. Look, I, I mean, I do think that it positions Knight Swift as a pretty, let's say, high volume carrier. Like if I'm Walmart, Target, if I'm a major shipper. Mm -hmm. Right. Like this is probably a good option for me to move a lot of cargo at a contracted rate that I can depend on and probably a highly competitive rate. Right. And and I've got to think also that Night Swift is sitting here, you know, just like we had an article a few weeks ago about Night Swift and interview. The guy was like, you know, we're just going to work on our business right now. The market kind of sucks. The spot market sucks. Like this will position them. Right. I mean, if the market turns around in the next few years and we're back to like 2020, I mean, they're going to rake it in, right? I mean, they're really going to create some earnings when, right. when the market turns around. So, right. For sure. Yeah. Um, interesting, interesting article, humongous news, honestly, um, two, two big companies uh, getting together. So that's, that's pretty cool. Matt, I, I think you wanted to talk about some, uh, some camera technology, huh? It looks like cameras are snitching on drivers. What else is new? Goodness oh. gracious. <laughs> right. Right. And I think this is important. We're gonna make this really quick, um, but I think this is, is an important distinction to make. Yeah, you're, you got this up here what a, from whatatruck.com. New driver-focused cameras provoke violations in Kentucky. So we sell cameras, we do cameras. I appreciate what cameras can do for a fleet, but the, this is, the distinction that we need to make here is that I like when fleets invest in cameras in-house to help them manage safety, to help them uh, reward drivers, all that good stuff, and recognize good driving and and coach drivers that might might need some help. Do I want the government in there with cameras and trying to track everything? No, and at the risk of sounding like some libertarian, you know, wing nut dude, I I just you know that's the thing. I I don't really need the the, the government in there trying to use cameras to uh, write tickets for seatbelts. Right. Um, do I think seatbelt use is a good idea? Yes. Uh, right. But do I want the government using increasing surveillance to write tickets? Hell to the effing no. So 
<laughs> right, right. Hey, it's a family yes. friendly show. But yeah, so Kentucky Transportation Authority <laughs> installed cameras focused on drivers. Okay, this isn't like a camera that reads your DOT number on the side of your truck. This is a camera that's like, you know, it seems like it was zoomed in focused on the driver. And they wrote out numerous, it says numerous violations of use of seatbelts and keeping a logbook. And, so um, and that wasn't yeah, even the reasoning for why they installed the camera. So that's why you can't let the government do that stuff because it always <laughs> metastasizes, right? They bring in something to do one thing they say, and then it ends up, you know. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, Flint, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on Kentucky? And, and I'm sure other states are going to follow now, right? So it's like, what are your thoughts yeah, on Kentucky? Yeah, I, I actually Kansas? was just, I just like punched in a quick Google and I, it's not, I'm going to probably have to dig deeper, but I'm curious like how they're writing these tickets, if these actually stand up. I mean, Alex, I know you're a Texan. Like, how many automated red light tickets do you get? And you just throw them in the trash, and they eventually go away because it's a civil penalty. It's not a criminal penalty. Like, they're literally like, hey, give us 75 bucks. You ran a red light. And you're like, no, F you. And they're like, hey, give us 75 bucks. And they're like, okay, never mind. Like, forget it. We were just trying to get 75 bucks, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I wonder what the actual teeth are behind these and if it's constitutional. Well, yeah. and, and if you can believe it, in California, they even were getting rid of these, uh, those those uh, right. cameras at intersections because they create such a hazard a risk hazard people are slamming on the brakes and stuff as right. the lights changing to to red so so it's gonna it's it might take a few years but we'll see what the what the blowback is from this but nonetheless if you're driving through kentucky it looks like on i-75 put on your seat belt make sure your logs are in order you know do a good job well, um and we know, uh, we know where and, they might go with it it's like we're <laughs> we're you, you we saw you using a combustion engine and we're gonna track you down yeah. Uh, well, we don't we don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of, of what the future may hold. But now, uh, guys, I appreciate you coming on. I want to jump into our interview with Cloud Trucks, a really good interview. And uh, it's it, it, we just we talk about the business and, and just really explore how Cloud Trucks is growing so fast and what they're offering different to owner operators. All right. We're sitting down with Kathy, who is head of product marketing from Cloud Trucks. And a little bit of backstory is uh, Cloud Trucks is a virtual carrier. Uh, and if you don't know what a virtual carrier is, welcome. I don't even know e either. But when you search into Google or when you search into the, you know, your, uh, your, the search engine of your choice, what is a virtual motor carrier? Cloud Trucks actually is the first one to come up. So uh, nice job, Kathy or team, uh, you know, getting that page ranked up there really high. Um, but look, that's where I'd want to start is what is a virtual carrier? Sure. So uh, we basically have two sides to our business. And one side is the virtual carrier side where we're a carrier. Uh, we onboard owner operators who want to lease on to our solution and our authority. So we essentially give them all the technology and tools that they need. We give them the platform, the load board, um, exclu exclusive loads from our shipper contracts, the insurance, the plates. And they have the freedom to choose where they drive, when they drive. So they're not company drivers. Um, they're completely independent owner operators who get the technology and the resources from um, a big carrier like us. Right. We're, and we're going to get in, we're going to see you covered a lot in that short sentence and we're going to unpack all of it um, uh, because I really do think that it's been a while since a like motor carrier was funded, um, like raised any type of funding. Um, it's been a while since uh, a motor carrier actually kind of changed the game, made it better. I think maybe I would say Landstar was possibly the last like startup that was doing something along these lines, which is like, hey, you know what? People don't like brokers, so we'll pay brokers are on our end. What I, I'm not really. I'm not an expert at the whole Landstar story, so but but it seems like it's been a solid 15 to 20 years since there's been some significant impact or some significant change or a company that's coming along and actually changing it up and making it better for the owner operators. And so this is why it's been really interesting to go back and forth with Cloud Trucks and uh, people from your team. It's been really interesting because I was at the Mid America Truck Show last year in 2022. And I, we're recording this as the Mid-America Truck Show is happening right now, um, but you'll probably be listening after it's already over. And uh, I remember talking to um, you know folks from, your, from Cloud Trucks over there and I was like, 
oh, okay, like this actually makes sense. So um, I'm, I'm really excited. It's been a long time coming. I think we've been going back and forth uh, for almost uh, six, eight months. Like we're coming close to a year. So um, so I appreciate, Kathy, you taking the time. I appreciate Cloud Trucks sitting down with us um, because I really do think for newer people that are looking to transition or, or for newer people that are either looking to get into trucking or for drivers looking to transition to become to owner operators and get some of those, you know, some of that scheduling benefits that you get from, you know, from making your own schedule, driving whenever you want, booking what you want. Um, a, this, a cloud trucks is an excellent thing. And uh, I want to get started with, obviously you gave a, par a partial explanation of what a virtual motor carrier is, but normally a motor carrier is like a trucking business that has a physical location. A virtual carrier is essentially, I don't think there's an actual FMCSA definition, but a, a virtual carrier is essentially um, has no trucks, has no physical assets, so sort of, but, and only leases on drivers that have their own vehicles, right? Something along those lines. Um, but I do want to talk about your two, your two main offerings, right? And so, like you mentioned, you have, if you are, have your own truck and your own trailer, but you don't want to go through the hassle of getting your own authority, owner operators can lease under you. And I see on your website, if you want to operate under our authority, it's 18% per load, um, which from what I've seen is reasonable, is actually really, really reasonable. So, I mean, kudos to the team. I think they, they did a great job on, on pricing this thing very, very fair. But that does lead me to a question. And initially, um, when Cloud Trucks started out, I know you mentioned it really, uh, really quick, uh, that you do direct freight now from customers. But initially, when, you, when Cloud Trucks started out, it was spot market, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. It was fully spot market, and we we now work with um, a variety of large shippers to provide more contract freight, more opportunities for our drivers. Right, and and that is is an interesting because obviously I have, I was a motor carrier, I had my own business, I was running spot market, and when the spot market is good, everything is going great, you know. But right when the, and, and we've had a, a quite a downturn in the last year or so. Um, how has the spot market rates affected? Um, owner operators, how like can you give any insight if that's been um, challenging to navigate now that the spot spot market has changed so drastically? Yeah, I mean this year is definitely very different from what it was a year ago and two years ago. And you know, in these times, you know, we really can't promise that oh you're going to make the same that you did a year ago or two years ago because the spot market has you know really changed um, across the country and. That I think has, you know, really pushed us towards having more of those ship, uh, shipper contracts and opportunities where we can secure higher paying loads for our drivers, give them more options, more opportunities. Um, and then at the same time, you know, we're, this is why we're also shifting towards focusing more on efficiency, more on productivity for drivers. Um, so coming out with a lot of different product features, um, a lot of, you know, new, um, like things like the schedule optimizer and CT estimates, which I can go into in more detail to help drivers negotiate for better rates. Um, you know, think about what are the best markets to enter and exit right now, which regions to drive to, how to just be, you know, more efficient and more productive with the time and the money that they have. Right. And yeah, I, I definitely uh, see you're, you're, you're getting, you're getting ahead, Kathy. <laughs> We're going to get there. And, uh, and this, this schedule optimizer, cause that seems like a really, really good thing. Cause I obviously from my motor experience, I know like, you know, you have a driver manager or a dispatcher or whatever you want to call them. And that person was essentially responsible for, you know, that was your, you know, actual person. That's your schedule optimizer. But now this seems like, well, if, it, if this is done on a, like, uh, I believe I watched a couple of videos about it. Um, it, it. Is it like fully software, a full software solution, the schedule optimizer, or is there like people that tweak it and make adjustments based on, you know, load capacity? How does the schedule optimizer work? Yeah, it's completely software based. So it's based off of the data from, um, you know, a past route that a driver um, has booked or, you know, filters and preferences that they've set in the in their app, um, you know, where they said they wanted to go, how much deadhead they're willing to go through. And we automatically recommend jobs and loads that would fit into their current schedule. 
and also help them stay compliant within um, their HOS. So mm -hmm. there's um, a lot of data behind the scenes that puts together this recommended schedule for drivers. Um, and it just makes it a lot easier for them if they don't want to put in the work of, you know, searching through hundreds of thousands of loads or, you know, working with the dispatcher or, you know, wanting to make those decisions themselves. This really helps them with all of that. Right. I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Where where were you when I was a carrier? Goodness gracious. I'm, I'm kidding, obviously. But but still, it's one of those things that like I think drivers underestimate. Like oftentimes what most carriers do um, that are operating on the spot market, what they do is they just go like, well, I'll just go for kind of the best load in a general area. You can't be too selective, right? And and that oftentimes leads you going like, you know, I've delivered to Montana. It's like, what was in Montana? Nothing. You got a deadhead to Seattle or back to Minnesota or something, right? And it's like, it seems like with all these data points that you've, you're you collecting from the driver preferences, they'll be able to actually select loads that meet their criteria and go. So if I want to do, I'm in Texas. So if I want to do a Texas to Chicago and back, it seems like with the schedule optimizer, I will be able to actually do that. Correct. Right. Yeah. So we try to create a full route. So you're not just going to, to one place, you know, you're going there, you're able to come back or you're able to go somewhere else. If you say that, you know, I want to be home within the next seven days, we find a route that will get you back home. Wow. That see, that's pretty neat. See, I'm, I'm telling you, like I mentioned, I think it's been a solid 15 to 20 years before, you know, a, a company comes along and actually shakes up the industry and offers something of, of, of actual benefit for the um, owner operators. Um, but the point remains the same, though, is that even though you could pre like pre-plan this route, the owner operator would have to call and book on those loads, right? It's um, some of them might be that instant book feature, but some of them they'd have to call and actually get correct. Right. There's a couple of different ways, you know, to book that load so they can, you know, tap on that load and book at the listed price right away. Or if they want to negotiate and have a conversation with the brokers and, you know, bid or, you know, ask for a higher rate, then there's still options there. We post the phone number, the broker contact information so they can really quickly book. Um, but, you know, it's not always easy to, to, you know, do that when you're driving. So, yeah, I I um I think we have a couple of different options for them so they can choose what works best for them. Um it there's also something else that we show. So we have estimates on every load. Um one thing that we found is it's really difficult to know how much to bid on a load, right? You see the listed price, you don't want to go too high and not get the load, you don't want to go too low and then like you're not making as much money as you could have. So um, again, we use data to create an estimated range for, you know, this is how much we think the load is worth based off of similar loads that came out of this region and, you know, the similar amount of, um, you know, miles, um, the pickup times, and we create um, this range to help drivers think about where they want to start, where they want to start the negotiations. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it's, it, you're, you're putting together lane rate data, which is super helpful to make decisions as a, as a carrier. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's fantastic news. And, you know, just to go back really quick to the direct freight conversation, it's a, like, I remember I was trying to get direct customers uh, in my carrier business and it's always this like, oh, well, we can't use you until you get more trucks. And it's like, well, I can't get more trucks if I'm still on the spot market. And so I, pull, I pulled uh, cloud trucks up on, on the FMCSA. It looks like you are, it says 465 trucks, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, has being at 465 trucks, obviously this number fluctuates from my own personal experience, you know, so you only have to update it once every six months. But the point is the same that four or 500 trucks um, ha at this size, has it been easier to approach shippers and go like, hey, we have a like a solid group of owner operators that can consistently come get your loads. Has it been much easier to approach direct shippers? I would say that um, there are a lot of different shippers out there. Some of them, you know, are looking to work with smaller carriers. Others are looking for our size and others are working with even larger carriers. So it's been about just finding the right shipper partners who want to work with us at this size and want to grow with us. Um, you know, we definitely see a lot of smaller carriers also working with shippers and we see, you know, much larger ones have more success with some of the enterprise shippers. Um, I think we've been really fortunate that we just, we have, um, 
so far secured a lot of these opportunities at our size and hopefully you know we'll we'll keep growing those partnerships right no i i agree i i absolutely agree that's uh that's just it's great uh i like that makes me happy uh because it's just one of those things that like it if you can get direct shippers that means you like there's a spread between a contract rate and spot market rate that's a public spread there's so it's like inevitably going for those direct shippers and contract rates that just makes it more beneficial for the owner operators and that's um you know they can they can rely on a on a decent consistent pay and the shippers can rely on decent consistent service you know probably with all of your uh, technology with tracking with all the like all the SMA, ETAs so um yeah that's that's really great um the other thing uh, i know we we talked a, a good chunk so far about your virtual carrier um you have multiple products but really the other offering that you have on the website i see right here is this if you have your own authority so I had my own authority and it looks like this is a subscription service. So at $99 per month, it, like I had my own authority, let's say I were to reactivate the authority, I could essentially take advantage of just for 99 bucks. Like, I don't know, you you folks probably have a ton of engineers. You probably have been working on this software for a very long time. And it's like, wait, for 99 bucks, I can take advantage of all of the great stuff that you've built. Talk to me about like what this, what this starter business management um, like what are the, uh, the, really the key benefits of that one? Yeah. So this is, you know, like you kind of mentioned, it's really for businesses who have their own authority. They're looking for a better way to run their business that they already have going. Um, so we provide the software, which is essentially TMS for small fleets so they can easily find loads. They can send professional invoices, manage their drivers and their equipment, and then have that option to also add on, you know, financial products like factoring or a fuel credit card if they want to be able to really complete, you know, the job cycle from booking to completing that job to getting paid out on it to seeing where that money gets spent all in a single app. Um, so I, I think this is really exciting because, um, you know, a lot of TMSs out there or, you know, traditional TMS, TMSs out there, it's usually desktop based and it's oftentimes run by an office admin because everything can be a bit of a manual data entry, right? right. But a lot of owner operators in small fleets, they're, they're not sitting in front of their desktops all the time. They're not entering numbers into a spreadsheet or entering in load IDs. They're often on the road, they're booking their next job while they're fueling up or while they're resting at a truck stop. So what we wanted to do was to really be a mobile first business management platform. But we do have a mm -hmm. desktop version as well, but we designed Starter you know, for someone who just needs to manage their business on the road, made it simple for them to search from hundreds of thousands of loads in a single place, book those loads, send out those invoices, track payments, uh, monitor their revenue, all from their phone while they're, you know, on the road. So essentially I could use Starter to book the load and then mm -hmm. I could, um, I, I'll get the rate confirmation, all the details, I would go pick it up. Um, uh, does, and then if the broker needs a location update, like obviously your, your app would offer tracking and location for the broker, correct? Um, so I wouldn't have to download any additional apps, none of that. Right. If they also have their integrations um, with their, or if they have their ELD integrated. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, which more than likely you probably would. Uh, and so, and then from there, I would see like, hey, this load is paying a slightly better than my average, or slightly better than the lane rate. And then from, and then from there, I'd be able to calculate what my costs and expenses are. And then once I deliver the load, I'd be able to submit it to you guys for factoring as well, right? That's a that's an additional product. And I would get paid out on this, um, Not on, is CT Cash part of this starter package as well? So I'd be able to get paid on it too? Yeah, so that's the add-on. CT Cash would be the factoring. Um, you have the option to add it on, or if you factor with a different factoring company or you just factor through the broker, you can also just submit um, your BOL and send an invoice from the app to an external factoring company. So we're not we're not locking you in like you have to use our factoring solutions in order to use Starter. Right, but I mean, like, 
hold on. Like I couldn't get off the road. Like I had, I was on the road for five and a half years. I literally couldn't get off the road until I was at like five or seven trucks. And so what you're saying is like, yeah, most fleet owners, most small fleet owners, and the data supports this. It's like, um, I think whatever it is, like 80% of all motor carriers are under five trucks. And it's like at five trucks, like a driver calls in sick, you're jumping in the truck as the owner and delivering that load, right? So it's like, oftentimes you are on the road. And so you're telling me, so a, a, a small fleet owner or an individual owner operator, if they have their owner motor carrier, could literally run their entire business and get paid all through one app. No additional load boards, no 14 different subscriptions, no 13 different websites they have to log in, no needing to learn Excel spreadsheets or whatever the case may be. But it's like really this small fleet could get a, a firm footing on what their cost of operations are, how much they're spending on fuel, why, you know, what, what lanes are more profitable versus others, all for what, $99 a month for this great subscription? That, that seems like a really good deal. It seems like a really good deal. Kathy, give a pat on the back for you and the team. <laughs> oh. I mean, yeah, when, when, you know, I was talking to customers and by the way, this is what I love about my job too, is just being on the phone with our customers and learning about their day to day. Um, I remember I had so many of these customer interview calls and drivers would literally be, you know, at you know, like waiting to get unloaded, they would be on the road, they'd be, you know, pulled over somewhere. They're not sitting, you know, at their desks here, like you and I are and, their, their life is really on the road and from their phones. And so we wanted to make sure that we're building something kind of designed for that lifestyle and right. not for, you know, the lifestyle that, that, you know, we think, you know, some owner oper or admins would have or what we have, you know, sitting in front of a desktop. So um, right. yeah. pretty much exactly yeah. what you said. That, no, that, that absolutely makes sense. Very, very smart. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's like as if as if truckers and owner operators don't have enough to worry about. You know, like they're stealing uh, dash consoles out of trucks. They're they're cutting out catalytic converters. There's not enough def sensors going around. It's like there's there's diesel shortages. Like they like yeah, they have enough to worry about. And it's like you could legitimately run a small operation with your phone and booking loads from all of the all of the load boards put into one and on top of that. So on the starter plan, would you be able to get uh, access to those direct contracts as well? So the direct contracts would only be available to our virtual carrier customers um, since you know it's it's our authority that we've contracted with the shippers and the customers. Um, so we we keep it for that side of the business for sure. Right. And then at that point you would be a broker. So it's like, well, then yeah. You, yeah, you'd have to get broker authority and all that. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. But still, so it's like still, I mean, each load, I had three load boards, each load board was, you know, $129, $149. So it's like, I was spending 300 something bucks on, on the load boards and, and per month. So it's like, if this integrates all of those load boards for $99, that alone is worth it. So yeah, it seems, seems very, very smart. And it's like, and I, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to be a hype man or anything. It's a, I've, I've tried to search on YouTube and watch as many videos as possible. And it's like, consistently owner operators are positive and they're nothing but good things to say. And so it's like, I really think cloud trucks, like this is what I'm saying. It's like, there hasn't been a good shakeup in the trucking industry for a, a solid 15 to 20 years. And it just, it, it's, it, it's awesome that finally a company comes along, they're able to raise funding, which is, I don't think maybe viewers understand how rare a carrier could actually raise funding. Like that just never happens. Like a motor carrier doesn't raise VC funding. So um, it, it's really, it's really exciting. I almost want to go back out on the road and be on a carrier. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Kathy, me and you are going to be driving trucks. Okay. This, this is how good cloud trucks is going to be going to get. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, sorry, Alex, sorry. one thing I did want to um, just clarify is that for starter, we do require if a driver wants to integrate DAT load boards to still have to pay the DAT subscription separately. And that's just our, our, um, you know, relationship with DAT, you know, we make sure that um, our customers have an active DAT subscription if they want to enter their credentials into our app and see DAT loads in our app. Ah, I see. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. See, uh, I'm, I'm out here getting, getting ahead of the curve. I appreciate that. Um, and then speaking of which, so obviously the industry is always changing. The podcast is called The Road Forward. Um, any, any final thoughts on where do you think trucking is going to be in the next couple of years? Um, any final things you want to add? 
Um, I would love to know where the trucking industry will be in the next couple of years. I feel like, you know, there's so many um, market conditions that impact where trucking goes. And I, I feel like a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have predicted that we're here now. It seemed like the spot market was so much stronger than the contract freight market. And now we're seeing a complete shift. Um, so it's really hard to say where the next couple of years are going to be, but we're just really excited to put cloud truck starter in the hands of owner operators and small fleets and just keep building this out for customers. Um, we just want to be able to solve more problems for truck drivers, help them get a leg up in the economies that they're, they're quite literally driving. So I'm excited for what's to come. Yeah. Um, and then last question is like, since we're, since we're asking about what the future holds, uh, can you give me the lottery numbers too, uh, just to prediction? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, obviously this is an industry that's always changing and there's always new things occurring. And so we, have, we, have, uh, we appreciate when companies want to legitimately tackle difficult problems to help move the industry forward. That's, that's awesome. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for joining me and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to do a follow-up call because this is, this is great. All right, will do. Thanks so much, Alex. No problem. You have a good one. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much, you guys, for joining us. And let me know in the comments down below what you think about the stories, about the memes, about the fun, and about cloud trucks. We look forward to your comments, and we'll see you next week. Bye.